I had had the tumor the doctor estimated for 15 years coming up to the time when I had a seizure and, and had to go in for emergency surgery. Uh, what happens is that the human mind is an amazing thing. It's very plastic. Uh, and as a tumor grows, and just to give you an idea, I mean, this tumor was somewhat larger than a, bill, a billiard ball and somewhat smaller than, a, than an orange. You're listening to an American Red Cross in Greater New York podcast. Today we'll be sharing with you a conversation I had recently with longtime Red Cross board member, volunteer, and donor, Conrad Meyer. As part of his work with the American Red Cross, Conrad volunteers his time to help people impacted by local disasters across the five boroughs and across the region alongside his fellow volunteers. As part of our conversation with Conrad, we talked to him about what brought him to the Red Cross, the evolution of his relationship with the organization, his work with other nonprofits, and how a major health issue impacted his life more than 10 years ago. All right, welcome, Conrad Meyer. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you for inviting me. Is this your first podcast interview? This is my first podcast interview, as exciting as that may sound. Well, we're really excited to talk to you. You have such a great perspective, great Red Cross perspective, great personal perspective. So it's just, we hope to be a really good conversation. Um, just wanted to get right into to your background. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from, um, where you grew up, um, a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, I grew up in Philadelphia, not so far from New York. Uh, went to college in Hartford, Connecticut, and uh, struck out for the big city New York uh, when I graduated. And I've been here with the exception of a little stint at graduate school ever since. Uh, I uh, got started early on uh, in the investment banking world uh, in uh, New York and uh, had a very active career for 25 years uh, doing mergers and acquisitions. And uh, for the last little over 10 years, I've been retired and have devoted a lot more of my time uh, to not-for-profit volunteer activities. So were you always involved in nonprofits, um, even while you were working? Because you had mentioned you had some you had some previous experience with the Red Cross. Yeah, um, and we can talk about this more because I think what I've learned over time is that there are different ways for you to be involved in the not-for-profit world depending on what stage of life you're in. Um, my wife and I, we were lucky enough to be successful, and so at about the time we turned 30, started to think about being a donor. Um, at that time, you were working really hard, uh, and you have, we had young kids at home, so there wasn't a lot of time, uh, but you could, you could donate money, and that was sort of the right thing to be doing at that period in time. Um, then, as you find you have a little bit more time or connections, uh, and this isn't the way that everybody goes about it, but actually being on a board um, is something that because of the limited number of meetings, something you have a little bit more time for. So, uh, and I guess uh, it was around, uh, I, we've been donor for a while. I've been on the Red Cross board for, I think, about 17 years now. So that would put me in my early 40s to join the board and be a donor. And then finally, when I was able to retire, I had the luxury of being able to be a volunteer as well. Uh, and... Each one of those roles is appropriate for a different point in time, but also helps to reinforce what you can bring to each one of those roles. Why the Red Cross? Um, I mean, there's other organizations. You know, what, what was it? There's so many other organizations that you could have donated to and been a part of. Um, why the Red Cross? We uh, decided that we wanted to put together a portfolio of charities that we would donate to. Uh, and we originally thought about the Red Cross as an international charity because we'd been familiar with what it does in international crises. As time went by, uh, we found out that the Red Cross does do international things, but actually, particularly to the entities that we were giving to, um, it was much more uh, nationally focused and, in fact, actually very regionally focused. Uh, and... As we found that out, having been a donor for a while, that was actually a transition that we were very comfortable with. And now um, I really value it uh, as a charity where uh, we can volunteer and give money 
and where we can see very viscerally what the results of all of our efforts are because it's right here. It's all around us uh, where we live. You, you've seen firsthand um, the work of the Red Cross, the impact of the Red Cross uh, as a DAT member. Um, and you I mean, talk a little bit about um, what you do as a DAT member. In terms of the work that we actually do, uh, we're on, uh, not even on call, we're actually on duty uh, a number of Tuesdays from 5 to 11 in the evening. Uh, the Red Cross here in New York, as some may know, uh, goes to every residential fire uh, to offer aid uh, to what will be our clients there. So uh, we have a small office in the Bronx. Uh, our team usually consists of three to four people. Uh, we wait until we get a call. Uh, there are eight to 10 fires, uh, every day in New York. So on most Tuesday nights, we'll get at least one call that we go out to sometimes more. Uh, we go out to the scene of the fire with a van at any of the five boroughs. Uh, we meet with the people who are afflicted, uh, and we offer them housing and help with clothing and food. Uh, and our role as responders is really to help them with their needs for the next two days, so very immediate. The Red Cross does a lot of tangible things, but one of the most important things we really do is to give them hope, to give them confidence. We talk about it as the arm around the shoulder. It's making people believe that it's going to be okay, and it will, but it doesn't always seem like that at the time. And that's an intangible thing, but it's so important at the time. And your ability to recognize that, both for your clients and for the other members of your team, just being a good person in that respect is super valuable. Um, can you talk about some of the, the team members you're working with? Is this, is this a core of people that you've been working with um, for quite some time, or are there relatively new members? Um, they, by and large, it's a, a core group of people. And you know, one of the things I should definitely say about being a Red Cross volunteer is that the people that I volunteer with have become actually really close friends um, and people that I value. Um, they're people that I enjoy spending eight hours with, whether there's something going on or not, and who I trust uh, to help uh, to help put together a response and to represent the kinds of values that I'd have in dealing with a situation. Um, and uh, it's a very diverse group. We have a lot of different kinds of backgrounds. But what's really nice about it is that if you think about volunteering your time, it's attracts people who care about other people. And so you automatically have in common with them that they care about helping others. And that's a pretty strong value to share uh, with other people. And I have to say that um, the Red Cross is really a family. Uh, and when I was ill, uh, a variety of people from the Red Cross you know, reached out to me, uh, contacted me, were concerned about my health welcomed me back when I came back to my first board meeting after the surgery. Uh, it uh, is a place where I could feel really comfortable and felt that I could add value. Now, um, from what I understand, you had a, a major life change um, and some health issues that um, um, changed your, your perspective and, and obviously was um, quite um, consequential. And Can you talk a little bit about that? I always had in the back of my mind that I wanted to try to retire early if I was successful and spend more time in the not-for-profit world as a volunteer. I probably would have kept on keeping on uh, in the banking world uh, if I didn't have a health event. Um, it turned out that uh, I had a very large tumor, a uh, brain tumor, uh, which was non-cancerous. Uh, but had the effect for a period of time of slowing me down and then finally really stopping me. I had a seizure and had to go in for immediate surgery. So uh, it turned out that I was just getting slowed down at about the time I was 50, which helped facilitate my decision uh, to retire, uh, which I think I would have done anyway, but actually maybe not. I, I would have been sucked up and in, in continuing to, to work on. Uh, so that really helped me to pause and, uh, I had surgery, which was successful. 
Uh, it took me a year or two to recover, uh, but it really put me in the mind of thinking more about getting around to that goal of being more involved in the not-for-profit world. And uh, the Red Cross was a very logical place for me to ramp up some of those activities because we had been long involved with the Red Cross. So just to go back on um, the, the, the tumor, how, how, how long was there uncertainty around, I guess, the, the diagnosis and kind of how, how did you get through that? Um, well, it actually was a very interesting situation because uh, I had had the tumor, the doctor estimated, for 15 years coming up to the time when I had a seizure and, and had to go in for emergency surgery. Uh, what happens is that the human mind is an amazing thing. It's very plastic. Uh, and as a tumor grows, and just to give you an idea, I mean, this tumor was somewhat larger than a, bill, a billiard ball and somewhat smaller than, a, than an orange, uh, and it was right in the front of my head. Uh, and what happens is that your brain is an amazing thing. Uh, as it finds it has less space or less capacity, uh, it shifts around uh, what it does to different areas of the brain, and it prioritizes what's important. So probably for the last three or four years uh, before I had the seizure, um, my brain was having to reroute things. So I found that I was sleeping for, you know, 10 hours or 15 hours a day. 15 is an exaggeration, 10. Uh, and uh, my wife will tell you that uh, I watched every Law & Order several times. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, the, during those sort of last three years, probably prior to the surgery, I was sort of shutting down a little bit, um, following the surgery, it takes a while, it takes a year or two for all your functions to come back again. Uh, and it's interesting because it's not immediately obvious to outsiders that you're going through this process. Almost immediately, a lot of, uh, functions and vitality return. Uh, but it takes a while for your system to settle down. Uh, and as it did that, I was able to explore uh, more uh, finding the right kinds of not-for-profit work for me to do. You talked about how you and your wife initially became involved with the Red Cross because of the international reputation of the organization, and, you got, and then ultimately found out about all that local work and got connected to that. You've since connected with an internet an organization um, that does purely international work can you talk a little bit about your work uh, with uh, this other organization sure um, there are actually two other organizations I can talk about um, on the, on the international front uh, I have a, a personal interest in the developing world on that side of the world I'm on the board of care uh, which is an international NGO uh, that uh, focuses uh, particularly on women and children uh, in trying to eradicate poverty and to work on social justice. Uh, and that's been very rewarding for me. Uh, and I also work with another organization called Pure Earth, uh, which works on industrial pollution, again, in the developing world. And both those organizations uh, have allowed me to do something a little bit different to complement the work that I am able to do locally with a Red Cross which is in an international context. Can you talk about um, a particular um, visit, trip that you've been on that, that marked you? Um... There have been a lot, um, but one that I would pick that was very interesting to me was visiting a, a camp in northern Jordan called Azraq, uh, which is one of the refugee camps for the refugees out of Syria. Uh, and uh, very interesting. It's a, obviously a very interesting situation in that the refugees that come out of Syria are really across the whole spectrum of socioeconomic uh, uh, criteria. Um, there are people who are professionals. There were people who were poor, all of whom were forced out of their countries. And Visiting this refugee camp, Azraq, which has 60,000 inhabitants, it's like its own little city, uh, was very interested in seeing what happens when a whole group of people are just transplanted from the place that they call home to a place that actually is floating in limbo. 
Um, you tend to think of maybe a refugee camp as being full of people who are starving. Uh, it's not really the case in Azraq. There's enough food to go around, but it's people who have had their lives suspended. And not only suspended, but suspended with no clear end. Uh, and it's, again, people who are poor, but people who are lawyers, uh, people who are business people. Um, uh, very interesting and very vexing situation. Did you ever draw any parallels? And I know the situations are very different from being in a refugee camp and seeing these people in need and then being out at a fire and seeing the, the need that's there. It gets very confusing, to be honest with you, because... It uh, causes you to try to have to to measure one person's problem and the pain that they feel from that against another person's problem and the pain that they feel from it, and also the immediacy of it. Um, and it's difficult to try to. I mean, the the obvious question that comes up is, you know, who's more deserving or who has more to deal with. Um, and I find that uh, it's, it's, sometimes it's better not to think about that. Um, you do what you can to help whoever you can where they are. Um, and you may have a different standard for what requires help, help here at home than you do somewhere else. And that's okay. You'll drive yourself crazy if you, if you uh, try to compare them too much. So we like to end all our interviews with one question that we've asked everybody. Um, and that question is, what piece of advice would you give to someone who wants to make a difference in the world? What I would say, uh, if I was drawing on my own experience, and I alluded to this earlier, is think about what you can do at the different stages in your life uh, to, to do good in the world. And so it starts with thinking about early on maybe where you can be a donor uh, and where you, and when it, and as and if you have time to be a volunteer, to explore different things, to find something that's a passion for you, uh, to find something that you really believe in, um, to find something that, if you could make it work, would really make you feel good, and focus on that and take it forward in as many ways as you can. Well, Conrad, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. Really fascinating conversation, and thank you for all you do. Well, thank you so much for having me. Huge thank you to Conrad for all he does for the organization, and thank you to all of you for listening. To learn more about the Red Cross and how you can support us, visit redcross.org. If you enjoyed this conversation and want to hear more, please share, like, subscribe, or leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. As a new podcast, we really want to hear from you, our listeners. This episode was produced by Chi Kong Lu and edited by Sue Tran. Special thanks to Michael Freiberg and Connor Lennon for their support. Thank you all for listening, and we hope you'll join us for the next episode.